We are now going to YouTube live in two seconds. <clears throat> now you are live now on YouTube, guys. May I uh, say hi, good evening to Professor Helen, Prof Dr. Tolo Aloba, and Professor Saad, and uh, Dr. Uh, Tharwat. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. How are you, Dr. Walid? Good evening. Hi, alhamdulillah. Hi, how are you? Good evening, Dr. Helen. Okay, Prof. Tolo. Yep. All yours. Okay. So uh, just to give me one second. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm delighted tonight to um, to start our um, regular session of our webinar, Mega Online Course. Um, uh, I'm delighted to introduce my excellent colleague as a moderator tonight, uh, Prof. Tolo Alogo. He's a professor of pain medicine in uh, Canada. Uh, I know him for the last 15 years. He's one of my excellent colleagues. He's my, my relation to him is beyond that. We are just a colleagues in anesthesia. We are very close friends. And he's always very good supportive to myself personally and to this online, uh, MEGA online course and the MEGA Medical Academy. Uh, Prof. Tolo, thank you very much for coming to control this session tonight. And you are very welcome, all, the, all you. My pleasure, sir. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to welcome everybody to um, today's tonight presentation. Um, we have some every weight that will be speaking to us tonight um, in person of Dr. Um, Ellen Girazi and Dr. Aisa as well. They'll be speaking to us on different topics. I'm just going to um, Clive and Don Jones to just um, introduce the two speakers tonight. I'm going to start um, with our first speaker for tonight. She's going to be talking to us about post thoracotomy pain syndrome um, in person of um, Dr. Ellen Garazzi. Uh, she completed her MD at the Marshall University uh, Medical Science and she all the postdoctoral studies in anesthesiology in German University of Medicine. Um, she got a pain fellow degree from Tehran University of Medical Science from Iran and she holds a fellowship of the interventional pain practice from Texas Tech University and the USA. Um, she's a private consultant in pain medicine in Iran. Um, she has published so many books and many papers about pain management in repeated journals. Um, she is serving also as an editorial board in so many journals as well. She has been invited to speak at so many meetings, both international and local meetings. Um, she's a pioneer on ultrasound guidance spine injection, and she's participated as a faculty and trainer in so many cadaver workshops and ultrasound, both ultrasound guided and fluoroscopic guided pain injection. She constantly contributes to the growth of pain medicine worldwide. Um, it's my honor and pleasure um, to um, have Dr. Garazzi speak to us tonight about post thoracotomy pain syndrome. So you can all have your questions ready. Um, this is one area I have um, very so much interest in, in terms of managing patients that had thoracic surgery or even have breast surgery that still develop um, post thoracotomy pain. Uh, she's going to talk to us tonight about the etiopathogenesis, how this patient present and also the investigation and all the interventional approaches in managing this pain. So um, I hand you over to Dr. Garazzi. Thank you so much. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you for introducing me. This is an honor for me to help for improvement of pain education in Egypt. Uh, hi, everyone. I wish you are uh, safe and well. 
Uh, I know this webinar series are really an uh, inspiration and motivation journey for us in this difficult pandemic time. In fact, I have been invited to Egypt many times, but uh, I was not lucky enough to see your beautiful and historical country. And I would like to thank Dr. Saad Mahdi for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, this was uh, really a good aspect of pandemic that uh, breaking barrier and brought us closer together. And Dr. Saad Mahdi asked me to talk about chronic pain. And also he asked me to talk about uh, intercostal nerve block and paravertebral block. So I choose this topic for you, post pain syndrome. Uh, Post-operative pain in as acute pain associated with surgical trauma accompanied by inflammatory process and diminishing severity by tissue healing. Thoracotomy is one of the most painful surgical procedure now because many muscles, many bones, joint, neurovascular structure, fascia, and parietal nerve are pain sensitive structure and injury during the incision. And when nociceptive stimuli generate during the surgery, it transmits to upper cortex via afferent originating from this structure and lead to chronic pain. And the chronic pain is that make any treatment many difficult. Can you share your screen, please? Is your screen shared? Uh, I don't know, I could not. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. When we tell post pain syndrome, when it lasts about two months after thoracic uh, resection. Prof. Helen, I don't see is, your screen share. Yes. I don't see your yes, screen yes, share. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, according to okay. Association Study After Pain, they say that two months is enough. Uh, we have many other uh, lecture when say the three or six months, you know, three or six months is most of time for chronic pain, but for post pain syndrome, two months is enough. And the pain is moderate to severe, typically numbing, tingling, burning, shooting. We have local pain and also we have radicular pain. This is very important. In post pain syndrome, you have radicular pain, even shooting pain, even. You have allodynia, you have uh, hypersensitivity, you have hypoesthesia, all that you will see in, in a kind of neuropathic pain. For the first time during the World War II in 1944, they uh, introduced this syndrome. And the incidence of it is very different according to the lecture. Maybe uh, you have seen 20, uh, 10, but in the recent revolution in the two, uh, 2020, uh, they reported 33 to 91% after thoracic surgery. And this wide variety, this is because of the risk factor for this syndrome and many BIAs that will happen during the study of the incidence of the syndrome. About the etiology, you know, we have an injury. We have injury due to incision of the thrust. And this cause a uh, rupture of the muscle, fascia, injured the joint. We have two, three kinds of the joint in a spine, in thoracic region. We have costochondral joint, costovertebral joint, costotransverse joint. We have even facet joint. During the resection and uh, during the uh, manipulation in the thoracic region may be some strain on this joint and even dislocation of the disjoint may cause uh, the pain, even chronic pain. And uh, even uh, in thoracic region is a special site in the body because you have a radicular nerve. This is the only site in the body that ventral root leave the uh, intervertebral foramen and pass under the ribs, a unique pass. And there is no plexus. We have not lumbar plexus or sacral plexus. We have uh, intercostal nerve uh, independent each other, pass under the ribs. And this nerve 
is near to visceral organ, near to uh, lung, near to parietal pleb. So it's possible that during the surgery, or even when you enter a chest tube, may uh, injure the pleura, and uh, there is possibility of visceral pain in uh, postural acotomy pain syndrome also. And the most common reason for postural acotomy pain syndrome is intercostal nerve injury. There are many risk factors for this syndrome, as I told you before. Many different from perioperative factor, surgical factor, and postoperative factor. Uh, perioperative factor, for example, if a person is young, uh, uh, she or he has more chance to have postoperative pain syndrome. Is uh, if uh, your patient is female, uh, there is more possibility of postoperative pain syndrome, and uh, there is also genetic predisposition for this syndrome. And some patients who have pain disorder, for example, fibromyalgia or physiological factor, contribute to higher prevalence of postoperative pain syndrome. And most important, presence of duration and severity of the preoperative pain is a risk factor for, for postoracotomy pain syndrome, as all of you know this, and surgical factor. The severity of the pain are determined to be related to the location and length of the incision. This is very important. Location and length of the incision. If the length is longer, the possibility of postoracotomy pain syndrome is more. Because of this, in video assist thoracic surgery, the incidence of uh, postoracotomy pain syndrome is lower, even half lower compared as you see the incidence. And the location is also important. Uh, they reported that uh, antrolateral and median sternotomy has less pain compared to postrolateral incision. And uh, we have also postoperative factor. Uh, as an anesthesiologist, because I know most of you are anesthesiologists, you know uh, control of the pain after surgery is very important. If you control the pain better, the possibility of postoracotomy pain syndrome is less. And always they use multimodal technique, use uh, medication, drug, many drugs, even ketamine, even gabapentin, even NSAID, even astaminophen, all of them, and regional anesthesia together and help the patient to improve postoperative pain to prevent postoracotomy pain syndrome. This is very, very important because uh, pain after uh, thoracic surgery is very severe, more severe than many of uh, incision. Uh, so if you control it better, the possibility of postoracotomy pain syndrome is lesser. And we have also we have also a uh, possibility of radiotherapy, chemotherapy, uh, and tumor recurrence. Always think to tumor recurrence after a patient comes to you with uh, an incision in thorax. You see the incision and say, yes, this is postoracotomy pain syndrome, but it's a possibility that you have a tumor which recurrent. And prolonged hospitalization. Prolonged hospitalization and its psychological effect as a reason of postoracotomy pain syndrome. So we have many, many risk factors. About the pathophysiology, although the pathophysiology of postoracotomy pain syndrome is not yet been fully elucidated. It is known that it is a complex pain, neuropathic pain, narcissistic pain, and visceral pain. This is very important. If we have a surgical trauma here, as you see, there is a surgical trauma here. It releases nociceptive uh, factor, for example, substance P, calcium generated peptide, ulotamad, NMDA activated. And they send a response from here to uh, dorsal root and then to control the spinal cord and comes to lumbic system and cortex. And we have also, after any trauma, change in the genetics. And all of them so, uh, impose patient to hypersensitivity to pain. We have extra discharge from the nerve. We have change in threshold of the sodium channel because of release of glutamine on other neurotransmitter. And all of them, 
uh, change the reception field of the prefrontal nerve and spinal cord and central system. And we have primary sensitization and central sensitization. And all of them is a mechanism for neuropathic pain. And this is the neuropathic pain which make treatment of the postural academy pain syndrome very difficult. And also we have visceral pain, as I told you, because in thoracic region, we have visceral organ. We have a frail nerve, we have vagus nerve, and this causes visceral pain in this patient. When a patient comes with a thoracic pain and refer to your pain clinic, this is very important that you know Although this patient comes with the SCAR history of thoracotomy, but, but you always must think about differential diagnosis. As I told you, maybe a recurrence of the cancer. So, because although pain thoracic syndrome are rare, about 5% of the patient who refer to pain clinic come with thoracic pain, but all this patient must be truly examined because of important underlying pathology. When a patient refer to you, with uh, a scar of thoracotomy and pain, first of all, you think about a post-thoracotomy pain syndrome or post-mastectomy pain syndrome, or after chronic RT bypass grafting, sternotomy, midline sternotomy also cause uh, post-thoracotomy pain syndrome. But always you have to think about the referral pain from internal organ, internal organ, even into the abdomen, from renal organ, from esophageal, for example, from pancreas, all of them may cause uh, thoracic pain. And spine related pain, for example, vertebral body, you may have fracture due to metastasis or even due to osteoporosis. Uh, and patient refers with thoracic pain and even have an scar. But maybe this pain is because of the thoracic uh, vertebral fracture, not because of the scar. So think about this. And intervertebral disc and facet joint and rib-related pain, this is very, very important. Even we have a manipulation of rib, even fracture of the rib during the surgery, and this is caused post pain syndrome, but patient may have other syndrome. As a pain specialist, you have to know many pain, uh, chronic pain syndrome in thorax. You must study hard. For example, post syndrome, Tourette syndrome, Malibral external joint pain, external syndrome, zifoidalgia, slippery syndrome, costovertebral joint syndrome, 12 rib syndrome, all of them related to ribs. And a patient referred to you with a scar, but maybe this syndrome. Please uh, uh, study about differential diagnosis of thoracic pain. And as I told you before, maybe recurrence of the cancer, or maybe even chest wall pain due to cancer, mesothelioma, Postoperatal syndrome, maybe effusion, maybe pancreas tumor, maybe related to diagnosis procedure or cancer pain treatment. And maybe patient has intercostal neuralgia due to post-herbatic neuralgia and you are confused about the diagnosis. And always you have to think about uh, myofascial pain and latissimus dorsi syndrome. This is uh, some uh, rib-related syndrome that I told you about them because during the surgery, uh, they manipulate the ribs, they have resection of the rib and um, even fracture it. Uh, there is a strain on the joint, joint that uh, connected the rib to the sternum, joint that connected the rib to the transverse process to the vertebral body, you know, ribs comes from anterior to the posterior, from anterior joint to the sternum, from the posterior joint to the vertebral um, by two, two joint, uh, costal transverse joint and costal vertebral joint. All of them may uh, undergo a strain during the surgery. And uh, the patient may comes with costal sternal syndrome, Tayas syndrome, a Sibirikin syndrome, and the uh, xiphoidalgia, maybe manipulation in mid sternotomy, cause trauma to the xiphoid. Uh, all of this syndrome, uh, the pathology of all of this syndrome is not known completely, but in the history of all of them, we have a history of trauma. So it's possible that patient comes with postoracotomy pain syndrome, have this syndrome uh, compound, uh, scar pain and test syndrome. And I had many patients with both of them. So a, a good physical examination and uh, 
understanding this uh, syndrome is very important for management of your patient. Uh, fortunately, thoracic pain syndrome, uh, most of the time, is a mild or moderate pain syndrome. And only in 5% of the patient have severe pain. And most of them respond to uh, conservative treatment. All the drug that used for neuropathic pain can use this in this syndrome. And I know you had many conference before about neuropathic pain. Uh, tercyclic antidepressant, amitriptyline, imipramine are from the first line treatment. And also they help to improve depression of this patient because all the chronic pain patient has uh, um, some kind of depression because of the pain. Pain is not a good thing. <laughs> and uh, also serotonin norafin draftic inhibitor antidepressant, venlafaxine and duloxetine, they help for, to remove anxiety in this patient also. And uh, anticonvulsant, you know, they are also first-line treatment in this patient and um, help patient for sleeping. And all of them has a uh, side effect that you know more than me. Antopiramide, which inhibit GABA and NMDA uh, together. And we have also topical drugs like lidocaine, which is very good for allodynia and for focal pain. And about uh, NSAID, there is no evidence for use of NSAID in neuropathic pain and in post pain. And opioid, opioid are the uh, strong pain relieving drug, which use for uh, as a second or third line for treatment of neuropathic pain. So this is the medication which we, you can use for treatment of the patient when referred to your clinic with post pain syndrome. But if your patient don't respond to conservation therapy, which may include tens, acupuncture, even, and even botulism toxin injection in the focal point of the pain, um, you can go to uh, intervention that I know you love it too much. Okay, interventional pain management. Uh, interventional pain management, uh, for the interventional pain management, you must first know about the anatomy. Anatomy is the first step for learning the intervention. So if you want to do the intervention, please first study hard about the anatomy. First of all, you have to know pain syndrome, different pain syndrome in thoracic region. You must be familiar with different pain syndrome in pain clinic, otherwise you couldn't help the patient. Then if you want to perform procedure, you must first know anatomy. Anatomy is very important because as you see here, the nerve exits from intervertebral foramen and then give some branches. First, give a posterior branch, which go to paraspinal muscle and to the facet joint, anterior branch, which go to the uh, sympathetic uh, gradamus communican and sympathetic chain. And then this nerve come here, a lateral branch. You see this lateral branch, uh, innervate the muscle and also has uh, uh, branches up to down. Because of this, we say um, there is overlap between intercostal space. Because of this, when uh, you work as, as the, an anesthesiologist for controlling pain during the surgery, not for chronic pain, you, uh, when you want to use intercostal block, use the, the block of the incision level and two level up and two level down. This is because of this uh, branch. And we have a small branch, anterior branch here. This is very important because most of time you don't consider this. This is the branch which gives innervation near to sternum. We see we have many different incision in thoracic region, maybe a small incision here in anterior maybe midline trochotomy, even we have a scar of the surgical drainage. In some of my patients, there is no pain here, just pain he is here. So be very careful. And if you know the anatomy, you can use it for block because uh, although you know that uh, intercostal block is done six or seven, eight centimeter lateral to the midline, 
but this is for regional anesthesia, for surgery, not for pain. For pain management, you can block the nerve everywhere, and it depends on the, the patient symptom and pain. For example, in, in this patient, always inject uh, a little lateral to the incision. It's not necessary to inject the posterior, and you can perform this procedure in any position, lateral, sitting, no difference, but almost all, all the time as I use supine or prone because I don't like my patient had a um, vasovagal syndrome. And in this patient, you can block here. You, can, you must block this nerve and lateral to this, you can block. And here, you must block near to this, maybe T11 uh, or T12. And in this patient, this is for video assist trachoscopy and it's very a small incision, so the chance of post-trachotomy pain syndrome is less. And in this patient and in this patient, this is uh, very painful. This is this cause. This has more incidence of postrachotomy pain syndrome because this is postrolateral. And in this patient, maybe you must use facet joint blood because this is near to the spine. This is very near to the spine. Maybe manipulation of the facet joint, maybe manipulation of costa vertebral joint, maybe manipulation of costa transverse joint, and most of them may be painful. And even some of the patients refer with this scar, but just complain from chest tube scar. And I had many patients like this. So this is very important that you perform a good physical examination and find the level of the pain and where is the pain. Pain is important, not the scar of the surgery. And uh, I told you about many different uh, procedures you can perform for this patient. Uh, as I told you, the most important cause of the postural academy pain syndrome is intercostal nerve injury. So the best procedure uh, is intercostal nerve block. And this is the simplest one and most effective uh, procedure that you can choose for your patient. Most of the time, I, I just block the intercostal space near to the incision, and some, sometimes a level below. And all the time, uh, I consider the, uh, uh, where is the incision? It is anterior, it is lateral, it is posterior, and inject uh, lateral to the inc incision, okay? And uh, selective thoracic nerve root injection, uh, this choice, when always, when I didn't have re good response from intercostal nerve injection, I use selective nerve root blood, which is very similar to this. Intercostal nerve in thoracic region is the only site in the body that ventral root come under the ribs, and you find it. This is not like lumbar region, you have plexus, lumbar plexus, sacral plexus, no. Uh, this is just under the ribs. And it's not necessary to uh, perform transforaminal blood because of the many complications of transforaminal blood as I uh, wrote about in my book, Safety Recommendation of Ultrasound Guide Spine Injection. I talk about this many times. Uh, so I don't recommend you selective nerve root block in this patient, but even when you have not good response from intercostal nerve block. And uh, thoracic medial blood block, as I told you before, uh, maybe uh, this is depend on the patient's symptom. If your patient have the uh, facetogenic pain, maybe combined uh, with a scar, you use a uh, medial branch block and paravertebral block. Paravertebral block is near to the spine and midline. and is very uh, near to epidural space. So uh, when you use paravertebral block, uh, most of the time this block and epidural block are the block of choice for uh, during the surgery, for uh, pain control during the surgery. But for uh, chronic pain management, post academy pain syndrome, you also can use paravertebral block. But because when you inject in paravertebral space, uh, this space is in, in continuation with epidural space. There is possibility that your drug distribute to the epidural space. So I don't use it in patient with this unstable patient and high risk patient. And the uh, intercostal block is more safe and more easy. Why I, I perform paravertebral block? Sometimes necessary to perform paravertebral block 
and but most of time intercostal blood is enough and uh, one good thing for paraverter blood is that it also blood sympathetic chain and if your patient have visceral pain or sympathetic mediate pain you can use sympathetic blood a paravertebral blood and the uh, interpural analgesia uh, this is always used for during the surgery uh, for chronic pain management really use this blood but it's possible to use it but because of difficult difficulty of incision and possibility of the lung injury uh, rarely use interpural analgesia thoracic sympathetic blood as i told you before we have a simulation of the phrenic nerve, vagus nerve, we have injury to the lung. So even parietal nerve may be simulated with the chest tube and we have a visceral pain. So we can use a thoracic sympathetic blood selectively. When we use paravertebral blood, there's possibility that the blood, the sympathetic chain, but in selectively thoracic sympathetic blood, you block the sympathetic chain. And thoracic epidural anesthesia, as you know, this is the choice for uh, uh, post-operative pain control. Very good result from it. Uh, but uh, for uh, post thoracotomy pain syndrome, I don't use epidural blood. As I told in my book, I, I, I will not uh, inject anything in epidural space because of this complication. So I prefer to choose more lateral block. When you far from epidural space, the complication is less because of this. All the time they introduce, for example, erectile spine block, pectoralis, serratus anterior prime block. Why? Because they want to be far from epidural space and this complication. So uh, you can use epidural block, but when you have intercostal nerve injection, why use epidural block? And then if you have not enough response from your blood, you can use neurolysis with uh, phenol, with alcohol or radio frequency. Also, I didn't use, use them. This is just for patient be, who has a, lot, uh, a short life expectancy. And uh, when you inject in a selective nerve block and your response is short, you can use uh, dorsal root ganglion pulse radio frequency. In dorsal root ganglion, you just uh, permitted to use pulse radio frequency, not conventional radio frequency. And we can use always, although pulse radio frequency on intercostal nerve, and it's easier uh, and we have good response. So if you inject intercostal and you had short response or your patient is not satisfied, you can use pulse radio frequency of intercostal nerve or dorsal root ganglion. But a uh, procedure for uh, Dorsal root ganglion is more difficult compared to uh, in, in partial deficiency of intercostal nerve. And a uh, new method of uh, pain control, neuromodulation, a spinal cord stimulation, very expensive. And uh, is used when patient is refractory to other treatment, we choose it. And the newer one, uh, dorsal root ganglion stimulation, uh, introduced in 2010 after they uh, didn't receive good response from a spinal cord stimulation, they choose a dorsal root ganglion stimulation. This is this, uh, very similar to a spinal cord stimulation. And the difference is that they directly stimulate dorsal root ganglion at the level of the pain, at the level of the incision. That's very good response. They found very good response. Okay, uh, again, review them. Dorsal root ganglion pulse radio frequency. It's it used for neuropathic pain syndrome and help in case where, where a radiculopathy is part of the pain presentation. Thoracic sympathetic blood is used in diagnosis and treatment of cross thoracic pain syndrome, such as neuropathic pain, chest wall pain, and thoracic visceral pain and neurolysis or radiofrequency ablation used for well-localized severe pain in patients with short life expectancy. I didn't use it. I, no time I use it. And neuromodulation. Neuromodulation is used for chronic well-localized neuropathic pain. A stimulation is just useful for neuropathic pain. 
and used in cancer survival and with chronic neuropathic pain. And myofascial pain syndrome, this is very important. When you're, we have them in all around the chest, in every muscle we have in the chest. For example, here, you see many trigger point. Even in external region, you have this muscle. So you have trigger point here. I had many patients uh, with, uh, for uh, open, thoracic, uh, open heart surgery and pain in sternum. Um, and although I block the uh, intercostal near to the sternum, I always release trigger point. And maybe even in this incision here, you have a trigger point too. So when you inject in intercostal, uh, use a, a trigger point release too, when you suspected to it. Intercostal nerve block today performed with ultrasound, but this is the fluoroscopy technique. You see here under the ribs inject and this is the spread of the contrast engine. With use of ultrasound, it's not necessary to use fluoroscope because the, only, the most important advantages of ultrasound is in thoracic region because one of the most important complications of the injection in thoracic region is ponomatrox. So when you can see pleb and lung tissue with uh, ultrasound technique, why use fluoroscopy? But some patient may use fluoroscopy. This is this technique. And this is thoracic nerve root injection near the intervertebral foramen and always used for a dorsal root ganglion pulse radio frequency. In refractory cases, I use it. And this is a thoracic sympathetic block here in T3 for patient who have visceral pain, uh, you can use this technique. And this is facet joint block, medial branch block, when patient have the symptom of acetogenic pain, although he has also uh, scar pain and post pain. And this is a spinal cord stimulation at T3 for a patient, 60 years old patient. This is a case report with post for 20 years. This is very interesting because post pain relieved during the time. Uh, but this patient had the pain and responded very good to a spinal cord stimulation. This is dorsal root ganglion stimulation. Uh, in a, a spinal cord stimulation, they enter the lead into the posterior epidural space. You know we have posterior epidural space and anterior epidural space. For a spinal cord stimulation, you enter the needle in posterior uh, epidural space. But in dorsal root ganglion stimulation, you enter your lid into the epidural space and conduct it into the anterior epidural space, then enter it to the frame and stimulate dorsal root ganglion, selectively uh, uh, inhibit the pain transmission. Okay. Uh, no. Technique. I know most of you love technique. Uh, I want to uh, uh, consider both technique as unique bind to simply teach you. Uh, in my idea, both technique are one technique because you see here, this is the reps, yes? As I told you, you can perform intercostal blood anterior, lateral, and posterior. This is posterior one. And you see this muscle up to reps. And this is transverse process. Transverse process is near to the midline. 
This is Reeves and here is transverse process. Okay, this is vertebra. We have also this muscle. The only difference is this space, okay? In this space, you have three muscles and all of you know them. External intercostal muscle, internal intercostal muscle, and innermost intercostal muscle. For intercostal nerve rod, you inject between internal intercostal muscle and innermost intercostal muscle, okay? So if you consider, this is here, this is uh, inter, inner, inter, innermost intercostal muscle and the nerve and exit here, and this is costal vert uh, vertebral ligament, okay? If you consider that internal intercostal, intercostal muscle ligament extend to costal transverse ligament, this is, would be very simple for you. Here you inject here, and here you inject under the costal transverse ligament. I explain it more for you later. Okay, see? For intercostal nerve block, you always, for uh, thoracic injection, use linear probe. This is enough because the ribs, even uh, transverse process, are very superficial. So uh, linear probe is enough. Uh, you put, uh, in this technique, you put probe longitudinally for both of them, for intercostal block and for para, uh, paravertebral block. Yes, see? The only difference is that put it here on the ribs, and in this technique, put it on the transverse process. And if you are very similar, you see, as I told in every webinar, that uh, when ultrasound wave received to a hard structure, for example, ribs or bone, uh, it couldn't pass. So it produced a hyper echogenicity up to the bone and hyper echogenicity or acoustic shadow under. So this is the acoustic shadow of the rib. And notice this run line. And this is the muscle between them. And this hyper quick line is PLEV. It's very helpful for diagnosis the PLEV. You see the PLEV, so you will not penetrate into it. The complication of this uh, injection. And here you see the transverse process put probe again longitudinally. And here, this is transverse process, okay? And look this line up to the down. This is costal transverse ligament. And in a good view of ultrasound with a good quality of your instrument, you can see this as a oblique line, hyper equic line here. Okay, I will show you in other pictures. So you can consider both technique as one technique. Yes? Your probe is here and move it toward here. And so you have paravertebral blood, very similar. I know most of you know how to perform intercostal blood. So if you know intercostal blood, you can perform paravertebral blood, no difference. When you want to perform intercostal blood, this is a schematic one. This is not you know, for a real person. Put your probe on the ribs uh, and consider that the space that you want to inject be in the middle of your probe. This is your probe, must be in the mid, middle of your probe, the space that you want to inject. And it's better that you have two ribs in your view because it helps you to perform your procedure and then enter your needle toward the here. Please look at this schematic picture and memorize them. It's very important. Sorry, Dr. Garazzi, just about five minutes more. Okay. You see, this is the muscle. This is the vessel between internal intercostal muscle and innermost. And this is paravertebral space, as I told you before. It's very important. This is, as I told you before, internal intercostal membrane continues with superior costal transverse ligament, okay? And both are the same. And we have many nerve here. As I told you, when you inject in paravertebral space, it's very near to intervertebral foramen and epidural space, okay? 
And always put your probe perpendicular to the ribs. We have rib here and put it perpendicular. And when you receive to the transverse process, transverse process has like this, they are oblique. So you must uh, turn the tip of your probe cephalate to be perpendicular to both transverse process. See this? Okay. This is the sonar anatomy. I put probe on the transverse process and uh, turn is cephalate. To see the transverse process, you see this round space is transverse process. I want to search for hyperechoic uh, costal transverse ligament, which is between these two transverse process. This is one, this is one, this is the line between them. Search for an oblique line. This is intercostal. This is the uh, acoustic shadow of the ribs. And this is the muscle. You see here is between internal intercostal and innermost intercostal very easily. The muscle parallel to tip of the, your rib is external intercostal. And this is a technique, uh, axial technique for paravertebral block. You put your probe uh, transversely, not longitudinally, near to transverse process as inject between transverse process and pleb. Uh, this is internal intercostal muscle. This is my choice technique because you have more space to enter your needle. And this is very similar to medial branch block in lumbar region. This is SIP transverse process, this angle. This is transverse process, pleb, this angle. It's a very easy technique, especially for patients which have a scar in the midline. And this is intercostal nerve block. This is the needle comes near to the pleb. If you could not see the muscle layer, come about near to the pleb. Maybe you can see the vessel here and enter your needle here and all the time aspirate and then inject. This is paravertebral block. See this line, hyperechoic line? This is the crossover transverse ligament. You may feel a pop. It's more thicker than internal intercostal muscle or in intercostal transverse block. And always play remove downward in both technique and confirm that your technique is correct. You can see both as one to compare them that both are exactly the same technique. A little difference in acoustic shadow of transverse process and uh, ribs you see always Turn your prop cephalate in transverse process when you receive near to the spine to have a good view of uh, costal transverse ligament. And we have also complication from this infection, injection, absorption rate of local anesthetic, but this is more important for regional block. In anesthesia, in pain injection, you use a low concentration, low volume, even one or two level, and you have not uh, the possibility of uh, toxicity of local anesthetic. But you have to know it. And pneumothorax and infection, as I told you. And over the last three years, we have many improvement in the uh, diagnosis of pathology of this chronic syndrome. And, and we have also raised awareness about the healthcare professional and the patient about the presence of the syndrome. 
and we have still much more work to do to improve our ability to diagnose this syndrome and help these people. And I, I'm hopeful that this lecture help you and improve your quality of your uh, treatment of your patient. And uh, uh, it's all. Thank you very much. Wow. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Garazi. That is absolutely very extensive overview. Uh, we appreciate the veracity, the details, and all the um, pictures as well. Um, I really hope um, maybe going into the future, um, Dr. Madi will be able to organize possibly a practical session for some of us to be able to demonstrate some of these procedures as well. Thank, Thank you once more, Dr. Garazi. Now, um, there are a few questions um, that have been listed out. We're going to be very fast with this because our time is fast spent. Um, one of the questions that was asked was, one, can we do cryoanalgesia post-op for patients having toracotomy pain? Dr. Garazi. Hello? No, we can't hear you. I, I am muted. I am muted. Okay. She was muted. Oh, you hear okay. me? Yes. Yeah, we hear you cryo now. Thank you. Yes, cryoanalgesia. They use cryoanalgesia even after the surgery. Hmm. Yes, but because of the possibility of uh, complication of uh, the blocking the nerve, uh, cryoanalgesia of the nerve, is, uh, they recommended that they don't use it during the surgery. But Correct. for post acotomy pain syndrome, yes, you can use it. It's very useful. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Now, the other question is, um, during your presentation, you mentioned that um, one of the most important mechanisms for the pain most patients experience for post acotomy is normally coming from injuries to the intercostal nerves. Yes. Somebody asks a question. How do you prevent that from happening? Is there this any is surgical the... techniques or is there anything the surgeon can do to prevent the incidents? Some yes. are comparing yes. the use of VATS it... procedure and open toracotomies. Yes, there are many comparison of the VATS and open trachotomy, and this is a proof that VATS is, is better than open trachotomy because the possibility of the injury of the nerve is less. This is obvious. Yes. Sure. Sure. Less now, tissue injury, less, less respect to the tissue, less chronic pain. Correct. Now, uh, another person asks a question. For patient having post-hepatic neuralgia, that's epizosta, affecting the thoracic dermatomes is what is your best choice of treating such patients? Uh, Hospital cervical neuralgia mm. has an algorithm itself, like mm -hmm. any neuropathic pain. It's a neuropathic pain. First conservative mm -hmm. treatment and then interventional treatment. Interventional mm -hmm. treatment, one of them is intercostal nerve block, Another mm -hmm. one is selective nerve root block. Another one is pulse mm -hmm. frequency of dorsal root ganglion. All of them you can use for this patient. And, and they mm -hmm. are very diff, uh, very resistant to the treatment. Post-herpetic mm -hmm. neuralgia is a difficult type of neuropathic pain okay. for management. Absolutely. Now, um, one other question somebody asked. You mentioned that instead of doing the convention currency of pulse RFA for the patient. He's now asking a question. Now, what about cancer patients that are going to be dying? Do you yes. worry about deafferentation pain after conventional RFA for those patients? No, 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 okay. no. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. okay. And the other question somebody asks as well is, what is the benefit of chemical neurolysis, use of alcohol and phenol? If you're going to be choosing between the two, what would be your choice and at what concentrations? I don't use uh, chemical neurolysis at all because mm. you cannot control distribution of your phenol or alcohol. Okay? Mm. So mm. I don't use them and I have no experience about it. Sorry. Okay. 
All right. Now, um, another question. So many questions for you, Dr. Garazzi. So many questions. Wonderful lecture you gave us. Now, somebody asked, you mentioned that there's genetic risk factor for patients developing post pain syndrome. Is yes. there any way you can identify some of the patient before they come in for surgery that they have the oh. genetic predilection? Yes, this is a very nice question. If we have mm. personalized medicine, you know today. And I have I wrote mm. a lecture about this and will be published soon in uh, Indian Pain Journal. I uh, mm. actually COVID uh, push out to the genetics because you know uh, mm. chronic pain in every patient, we have a genetic predisposition to chronic pain. It is approved. Sure. And we have very diff mm. different genetic response to the drug. So in personalized medicine mm. or persistent medicine, they try to find a patient who are uh, superimposed to, this, to the chronic pain or even post racotomy pain. And uh, they work on the uh, genetic drugs, they work on to find this gene and to, to gene therapy in future would be the future of chronic pain treatment. I believe in it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And Thank I think you. finally, before we go to the next lecture, somebody has asked you about intercostal infiltration. Is there any benefit of infiltrating the site of the surgery? You mentioned something very important that not all centers have access to spinal cord stimulation. Not all centers have access to DRG. What they have in their center is infiltration. What concentration of local can they use in that yes. regard? Yes, for pain management, the you can use uh, lowest concentration. For example, I use mm. 0.1 to 5% of bopivacaine or ropivacaine. About one or two uh, ml is enough. Yes. And okay. in my patient, okay. uh, I, I didn't mm -hmm. use a spinal cord stimulator or DRG stimulation because it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. We have not disability in our country. True. And none of my patients need to this uh, expensive uh, instrument. Absolutely. We can, you can control Absolutely. your patient, repeat the injection. Every, mm -hmm. when your patient have, okay. again, the patient refer to you and repeat the injection or, or even use okay. uh, radio frequency or even use phenol or alcohol, chemical neuralizers if it's, it's not, if you have not other possibility of use another instrument. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your question. Fantastic. Um, we just want to thank um, Dr. Garazi for the very outstanding lecture you've given us. Thank you for the fantastic overview. Um, I'm sure um, uh, the, the big organizers of this meeting, um, Dr. Madi and group, we're going to organize a practical session. We can Absolutely. actually demonstrate how some of this block can be done. I want Absolutely. to say big congratulations to Dr. Wide, Dr. Madi, thank you so much for this amazing work you're doing. And Dr. Garazi, once again, thank you. Now, thank you. we're going to be going thank to you. the second lecture of the day. Um, it's going to be on pulmonary embolism. Um, very interesting topic that we all need to know about um, as anesthesiologists, even as internists that work in the a medical ward, patients are predisposed to having either a divine thrombosis that can progress into pulmonary embolism. And the mechanism by which this happens, we need to at the same time understand the way to actually treat this patient as well. Now, without much ado, I'm going to be introducing to us one of the experts in this field to give us a presentation. Um, with your honor and respect, I introduce um, Dr. Tawad Aisa. Um, Dr. Aisa completed his master's in anesthesia and MD in anesthesia, a master's in 2006 and MD anesthesia in 2015. And he has a diploma from the European uh, College of Intensive Care Medicine in 2012. He equally obtained the European Diploma of Anesthesia and Intensive Care in 2018. He has worked as a consultant in anesthesia and intensive care in Egypt. He was a former associate consultant at the Intensive Care Medicine in King Abdullah Medical Center in Makkah. He has 
currently working at the Our Lady of Lords Hospital in Ireland. Wow, amazing. One of the places I started my own training as well and is highly interested in ICU research and he has he is a very, very published man. He has so many publication, peer reviewed publication. With due honor and respect, I present to you Dr. Tawad Isa to speak to us about pulmonary embolism updates. Thank you so much, Dr. Isa. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tolo, for your uh, nice introduction. And I would like to thank Dr. Mahdi and uh, the rest of the organizing committee for having me tonight. And I'm going to talk about the pulmonary embolism updates and, uh, and outline to the topic today. I'm going to touch the epidemiology and we will talk in details about the diagnosis, prognosis, and of course the available management lines according to the current evidence and guidelines. And of course, we cannot talk about vena thromboembolism without talking about COVID-19 related vena thromboembolism. And if we have a good time, we can talk about algorithmic approach for uh, the management. As you can see here, guys, uh, in this uh, picture, this is an autopsy specimen for, uh, two, for the lungs and the pulmonary artery, which is filled with the thrombus inside. And as you can see, and both lungs are infarcted. Of course, we don't want our patients to be like this. So in terms of epidemiology, uh, in the US, we have uh, more than 530,000 of cases uh, of symptomatic pulmonary embolism per year. And the mortality is high, as you can see, uh, up to 300,000 per year. And 54% of the patients pass undetected, unfortunately. And in some uh, recent uh, studies released about COVID-19 related thromboembolism, the incidence up to 24%. Uh, and you can prevalence is going to be doubled by 2050. Uh, so it is going to be a journey uh, among the different uh, available guidelines, American College of Chest Physicians guidelines, and American Heart Association guidelines, latest version of European Society of Cardiology guidelines 2019, and anticoagulation forum as well. So uh, starting with the definitions and why uh, we, we should know the definitions for each type of pulmonary embolism. It is very crucial because it has its clinical implication for further risk stratification of such patients and subsequently the management. So what is the massive pulmonary embolism? What, what do we mean by massive pulmonary embolism? That is a patient who has hemodynamic instability and it is determined in the guidelines by systolic blood pressure below 90 or if the patient is hypertensive and he has a, a reduction in the blood pressure for 40 millimeter of mercury or more from the baseline plus signs or symptoms of hypoperfusion. This is what we are calling the patient that has obstructive shock due to pulmonary embolism. This is the patient we are calling him, he has massive pulmonary embolism or high risk pulmonary embolism. What is about the submassive pulmonary embolism? Those kinds of patients are hemodynamically stable. So the systolic blood pressure is more than 90 millimeter of mercury but they have an evidence of right ventricular dysfunction in echo. And those kinds of patients are further risk stratified more into high risk and low risk. And we are going to talk about this in a couple of minutes. So the last one is the low risk pulmonary embolism or the non-massive pulmonary embolism. That is the patient who is hemodynamically stable and he has no RV dysfunction and normal biomarkers, normal troponin and BNB. And this is, of course, a patient out of our scope tonight. Uh, so in terms of the pathophysiology of pulmonary embolism, as you can see here in uh, this figures, uh, that a relationship between the mean pulmonary artery pressure and the flow, which is the right ventricular cardiac output. And this is low presence of pulmonary vascular resistance, actually. And the steeper the slope of 
this curve, the steeper the slope, the higher the pulmonary vascular resistance. And of course, you can see the more workload on the RV. So the RV is more suffering here with increased resistance to push the same volume of the cardiac output. So in this diagram, there is a cascade of events will happen due to the pulmonary embolism, the major pulmonary embolism or the obstruction in the pulmonary vessels. Pressure overload on the RV will subsequently increase in the wall tension. And of course, the oxygen demand will increase. And this leads to right ventricular decompensation and decreased RV stroke volume or RV overload. Load. This will lead to RV overload and septal shift to the left side, which will subsequently decrease the left ventricular end diastolic volume and finally low cardiac output, shock state, more hypotension to the patient and uh, the coronary perfusion pressure will decrease. The RV will be more compromised and there is some reports that the RV will have uh, sub endocardial infarcts. And this is the reason why you will find a troponin leak in such patients in addition to elevations of the BNB and uh, pro BNB. And it is a vicious circle. You should cut this circle by uh, using any kind of reperfusion to your patient. Uh, you can see here in this study that uh, uh, a comparison between the patients who has underlying cardiopulmonary disease versus the patients who has a good cardiopulmonary reserve in terms of angiographic obstruction or pulmonary artery, mean pressure will be higher, of course, the cardiac index will be much lower, and the total pulmonary resistance will be much affected in such patients. So the outcome will depend on the burden of the embolus and the severity of the pulmonary embolism and the underlying cardiopulmonary status and RV dysfunction, of course. If you have a patient who has massive BE obstructive shock, the mortality approaches 30%. If the patient has developed the cardiac arrest because of the pulmonary embolism, the mortality is much higher, up to 70%. Risk factors, of course, it is well known, virtual triad of the stasis, endothelial injury, and hypercoagulability. And we have inherited hypercoagulability state or thrombophilia, that's protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency, factor V laden and uh, also acquired the thrombophilia state due to immobilization of the patient for more than 48 hours, surgery, malignancy, some hormonal therapy, and surgery specifically, uh, the pelvic surgery and uh, um, neurosurgeries, and also some other factors of acquired thrombophilia like morbid obesity and heparin therapy even. In terms of diagnosis and the prognosis, you guys know that the, the presentation of pulmonary embolism is very variable and uh, the manifestations varies from uh, dyspnea in 79% of patients and tachypnea in 57% of patients, tachycardia, chest pain. And for the gas exchange, you should know that not every patient with pulmonary embolism will develop hypoxemia. In 32% of patients will have a BO2 of more than 80 millimeter of mercury. And the most of the patients will hyperventilate to PCO2 below 40, that's 81% of the patients, despite you have increased the space in such patients. Third of the patients will have a normal alveolar arterial oxygen gradient. And the evidence behind that is a PIOBID and DUBID trial. These are the largest trials uh, studied uh, the manifestations, presentation, and the investigations for uh, pulmonary embolism. You can find some non-specific to the pulmonary embolism, but sometimes you can find this ECG changes like deep S and lead one, Q3, and T3 triad. You might find also sinus tachycardia, right axis deviation, right bundle branch block. This is due to pressure overload or right ventricular strain. Also, one of the common uh, atrial tachycardias in patients with pulmonary embolism is the atrial uh, fibrillation. Chest X-ray uh, studied also in the biobed and diobed trials, 
and they found that uh, normal chest X-ray in uh, the range of 16 to 34 percent of patients who will find the X-ray is totally normal, but you might find some clues for the pulmonary embolism, like atelectasis or uh, consolidation, which represent uh, lung infarction, or you can you can find some uh, pleural effusion. But still the gold standard for diagnosing pulmonary embolism uh, uh, in terms of the imaging studies is the CT pulmonary angiogram. And uh, it is better to correlate the CT pulmonary angio findings with the clinical probability of the pulmonary embolism. You can see the positive predictive value of the CT pulmonary angio approaching 96% of the patient has high clinical probability uh, of pulmonary embolism. And the negative predictive value to rule out pulmonary embolism in a patient who has low clinical probability is 96%. So in the guidelines, you are safe to reject the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism without further testing. If the CT pulmonary angio is normal and you have low or even intermediate clinical probability for pulmonary embolism, and this is a high level of evidence. And also you are safe to accept the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. If the CT pulmonary angio showing gives the filling defects and you have intermediate or high clinical probability. In some situations, there is discordance between the clinical probability or your clinical judgment and the testing, which is a CT pulmonary angio. This is the patient who will need further testing. VQ scanning also studied in the uh, BioBit trial and uh, it is safe to roll in or to roll out pulmonary embolism with high probability scanning if correlated with clinical probability score. So if it is high clinical uh, probability and high probability scanning, it is approaching 96%, while it's 4% uh, if it is low clinical probability. So we are talking about clinical probability. So you guys should know that any patient admitted with pulmonary embolism, either you are consulted to see him in the ED on the ward or admitted to your ICU, you should do clinical probability for the patient before asking for any test because all the results are correlated to the clinical probability. Moreover, you should also risk stratify your patient in order to categorize my patient is high risk BE or massive BE or he is intermediate risk BE or low risk BE because the management will depend on this and also the disposition of the patient to the ward or to the ICU will depend on the risk stratification. So the commonly used scores and the commonly validated scores uh, and the guidelines is the Wells score or modified Wells score and Geneva score. Don't bother yourself uh, to memorize these items, which is uh, clinical signs symptoms of DVT, pulmonary embolism is in the top of your differential diagnosis or the most likely, or tachycardia, heart rate more than 100, immobilization at least for three days, or history of BE or DVT or cancer, and you can because it is available everywhere in uh, the applications, uh, MedCalc, or you just Google it, you will find it and you can calculate the side within a few seconds. If the patient is uh, having a score of more than six, this is high probability. If it is below two, this is low probability between is intermediate. Or in the modified score, you can see that if uh, uh, the score is more than four, BE is likely, or for or below the PE is unlikely. Of course, Geneva score also is well mentioned and you can use one of them. For the risk stratification, this is uh, uh, mentioned uh, uh, in the guidelines, the simplified pulmonary uh, embolism severity index and it correlates the 30 day mortality for pulmonary embolism with this score. And this paper is talking about the simplification of uh, the pulmonary embolism severity index for uh, prognostication of such patients. The 
uh, they only used the six items of the score, which is age above 80 and the history of cancer, COPD, tachycardia of 110 or more, blood pressure below 100 or saturation below 90%. If you have one of this, this you can say simplified pulmonary embolism severity index of one, this is correlated with mortality, 30-day mortality of almost 11%. If it is zero, the mortality is down to 1%. Biomarkers, uh, as we have mentioned earlier in the pathophysiology that there is trombone leak in the patient who has RV dysfunction, RV strain, and also due to volume overload and the stretch of the right ventricular wall, you will find BNB and pro-BNB high. And these biomarkers are very important for risk stratification of such patients and for further uh, uh, management steps later on. Um, and the evidence behind uh, 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 testing the biomarkers in such patients, there is one of the meta-analysis done for uh, 20 of 20 studies. They found that elevated troponins uh, is associated with five-fold increase in the mortality. And also in a meta-analysis of 16 studies, they found that PNP more than 100 is associated with six-fold increased mortality. So combining two studies together increase the prognostic value, of course. What is about D-dimers? D-dimers is commonly used uh, in a patient who, are, who is suspected to have pulmonary embolism. And you know, guys, that it has a very high sensitivity of 95% and a quite low specificity, 40 to 68%. It has a good negative predictive value to rule out the pulmonary embolism, but you should be cautious, should be correlated with the clinical probability. In the guidelines, you mentioned that it is a good negative predictive value in patients with low pre-test probability. That's why you have to do the clinical probability at the bedside for your patient. Also, one of the most important points to consider when you are interpreting the D-dimers that the type of test matters in order to have a good sensitivity for the D-dimers, it should be done by quantitative ELISA to be dependable in rolling out the pulmonary embolism. Also, that D-dimer level and the cutoff value is dependent on the age above 50. Above 50, the cutoff value is decreasing up to 10%, uh, the sensitivity in the patients at the age of 80. So you can just calculate your cut. Before in the guidelines, they mentioned the cutoff value of 500 for the D-dimers Below 500, you can rule out pulmonary embolism. But in the latest guidelines, they mentioned that you have to correlate your cutoff value with the age of the patient. For example, if you have a, a patient who has age of 70 year old, multiply this times 10 microgram per liter. So the cutoff value for this patient is 700 microgram per liter. To use it with cl low clinical probability, you can rule out pulmonary embolism. It is also recommended not to use D-dimers for ICU patients, especially who, who have a high risk of probability, high risk of pulmonary embolism. If you have a patient who has high clinical probability for pulmonary embolism, forget about D-dimers. It is unsafe to depend on D-dimers to rule out pulmonary embolism in such patients. Also, um, in terms of predictors for mortality, the imaging studies, and on the top of the imaging studies here is the echo. And always we have an argument with the cardiologist that my patient uh, in need for echo, he is hemodynamically unstable or even stable, but I want to rule out RV dysfunction in order to risk stratifying. So, so echo is very important for the prognosis and for diagnosis and for risk stratification. So the evidence behind the use of echo in uh, pulmonary embolism patients is one of the interesting meta-analysis that is done uh, uh, for uh, um, more than, included more than 12 studies 
and recruited more than uh, 3,200 patients who are hemodynamically stable. But they studied the RV dysfunction. So they found that in the patients who have RV dysfunction, the mortality almost double the patients who have no RV dysfunction. 13.7% versus 6.5%. See how the echo is valuable at the bit side. In another meta-analysis of 239 patients included from four studies, they found that if you have a hemodynamically stable patient with pulmonary embolism and the RV function is normal, the mortality is almost zero. So echo is very important for risk stratification. If you have a patient who is shocked, you might consider reperfusion therapy, but if the patient is not shocked, and you have done the echo, and the echo showed RV dysfunction, and he has elevated troponin. So this patient has intermediate risk pulmonary embolism, which is intermediate high risk pulmonary embolism. This is a submassive pulmonary embolism. And this patient might be considered for reperfusion therapy, the same as the patient who has high risk pulmonary embolism. But if you have a normal RV function, so this patient might be considered for therapeutic anticoagulation only. So what are the findings you might encounter in uh, the echocardiography? In all the views, you can have some information like the barosternal long axis view, you can see the dilated RV in the apical forehead chamber view at the base <clears throat> of the RV LV ratio more than one and the McConnell sign hyperdynamic apex with hypokinetic free wall of the RV or in the uh, barosternal short axis view, you can see flattened septum and D-shaped septum. In the subcostal view, you can see the dilated non-collapsible IVC. And also in the short, one of the short axis view, the Doppler study of the pulmonary flow, you can find the 60-60 sign, which is the coexistence of acceleration time of pulmonary ejection below 60 in addition to the big systolic gradient as a tricuspid valve and uh, the apical forward chamber view, which is below 60. And also one of the interesting uh, studies uh, to date studied uh, uh, the echocardiographic findings for a patient who already diagnosed as pulmonary embolism by CT uh, pulmonary angios, they found the systolic notch here in as a Doppler study is very sensitive and specific for diagnosing pulmonary embolism. And you might find also a thrombus in the RV or the RE, and you can measure the tap C by the M mode, which will be uh, below 16 millimeter of mercury or 1.6 uh, centimeter. This is uh, uh, denoting uh, RV dysfunction. And this is a study for the 6060 sign, and the McConnell signs are reliable signs for pulmonary embolism, but not sensitive signs for acute pulmonary embolism. This means if you uh, if you have uh, uh, if you haven't seen McConnell sign and 66 sign, this means that uh, it doesn't mean that pulmonary embolism is ruled out. So in terms of the management, uh, of course, uh, we, we will talk uh, a bit about the airway breathing and uh, the hemodynamic support by fluids, pressors, and uh, we'll talk about the anticoagulation, thrombolysis, and surgical management, and of course, the IVC filter. For the ABCs, starting with the airway and the breathing, as we have mentioned that most of the patients are not hypoxemic and they have a god uh, BO2 uh, above 80, so rarely they will need a high flow oxygen, except if it is a high risk pulmonary uh, uh, embolism or intermediate high risk pulmonary embolism. So uh, during the induction time and post pressure ventilation, that is very crucial time for those patients because the RV is compromised and with post pressure ventilation, uh, uh, it is gonna be compromised more. So please be very careful during the intubation and mechanically ventilating such patients because they might arrest only during the intubation and the start initiation of post-pressure ventilation. 
they don't need high beep and they don't need high tidal volume. You can use 6 ml per kg. That's more than enough. Keep your target plateau below 30 centimeter of water and always use anesthetic medications during the induction, which cannot compromise uh, uh, the hemodynamics. Also in the guidelines to just avoid this situation, you can use high frequency nasal cannula and trial of NIV if it is not contraindicated, of course. Uh, regarding the hemodynamic support uh, uh, fluids, yes, we can give some fluids cautiously and judicious fluid management is very crucial in such patients because you might compromise the RV more with excessive fluids because there is ventricular interdependence. As we have mentioned that the interventricular uh, septum will be shifted to the other uh, side which decreasing the left ventricular endostolic volume, compromising the cardiac output and shock state more. And the first uh, choice for the vasopressors is the norepinephrine. You might consider dobutamine if, you, if the blood pressure is fine, but you have low cardiac index and the hypoperfusion state, you might consider dobutamine as well. There is reports about uh, levosimendan. It improves the cardiac or the RV pulmonary coupling. So levosimin then can be considered. Also, the, sorry, uh, there is some reports using the nitric oxide and the ECMO. ECMO, you know that ECMO is a bridge for something. So uh, if you are gonna, if, if your facility has uh, uh, ECMO and you can consider ECMO in a patient who has refractory uh, shock or uh, BA-related cardiac arrest, refractory hypoxemia, uh, but it is a bridge to uh, reperfusion therapy. You should consider surgical embolectomy or catheter directed therapy in such patients. Otherwise, no RCTs to support the ECMO uh, so far. Uh, so um, in terms of anticoagulations, if you have a high clinical suspicion of pulmonary embolism, that is a high or intermediate uh, clinical probability, you should start anticoagulation upfront immediately. And this is a high level of evidence. Of course, still the recommendation is to use unfractionated heparin IV infusion as per your local protocol. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable or you have a high risk of bleeding or renal dysfunction with creatinine clearance below 30. For intermediate and lower risk, the recommendation with high level of evidence is to use the low molecular weight heparin or pendabarnex uh, over unfractionated heparin. Uh, what is about NOAX? Uh, novel oral anticoagulants like rivaroxaban, abixaban, dabigatran can be used uh, to replace the vitamin K antagonist, which is commonly used, the warfarin, uh, I mean, uh, uh, instead, and it has uh, no inferiority uh, in the studies to warfarin. So it is highly recommended to be used, uh, but it's contraindicated to be used during pregnancy, lactation, or renal impairment. Uh, thrombolysis, uh, thrombolysis has its pros and the cons, um, and the pros, it has a, a short term improved RV function and also improvement of the pulmonary perfusion. In one of the meta-analyses, uh, 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 there is improvement in the uh, mortality and short-term recurrence of pulmonary embolism. But the cons on the other side, there is increased risk of bleeding and also no clear evidence of long-term improvement in the RV function. So what is in the guidelines? There is a lot of debate in this point. It does it improve the mortality or not, but always go to the guidelines. All the guidelines with different levels of, uh, of evidence, almost near to each other in the level of evidence, it is supporting to give uh, the thrombolytic therapy for the patient who has massive pulmonary embolism or high risk pulmonary embolism. That is a patient who has obstructive shock and no contraindication to uh, uh, thrombolysis. Uh, also from the American Heart Association, almost the same, and from the European Society of Cardiology guidelines, the latest version, the level of evidence is higher than the others. Thrombolytic therapy is recommended, follow stop. So what is about the intermediate risk? We talk about the massive or high risk pulmonary embolism, and of course, low risk or non-massive 
This is out of our scope. This is not an ICU patient in any way. So what is the intermediate risk of pulmonary embolism? If you are talking about something in the gray zone, which is intermediate, always there is controversy and debate. Somebody will say, I'm going to thrombolize this patient. The other one, he will say, no, I will not thrombolize such patients. Only I will therapeutically anticoagulate him. And both of them are right. Depending on what, depending on the situation, the clinical presentation of the patient, the risk of bleeding, the age of the patient, the comorbids, and so. So one of the evidence behind uh, the thrombolytic therapy and intermediate risk pulmonary embolism is the BTU trial. This is the biggest trial to date. It is a very big RCT, studied the thrombolytic therapy in a patient with intermediate uh, risk pulmonary embolism. They randomized more than 1,000 patients for five years in 13 countries, multi-center international one, who are hemodynamically stable, but they have RV dysfunction and high troponin. So by definition, this is intermediate high-risk pulmonary embolism. One arm received the heparin plus placebo and the other received the heparin plus thrombolytic therapy in the trial it was tinctible, is. The risk of bleeding was much higher in such group received the thrombolysis 11.5% versus 2.4% only on the other arm. But all cause mortality and the hemodynamic decompensation which was of the RV uh, which was the primary outcome in, in, in this trial uh, uh, was 2.6% versus 5.6% in favor of thrombolysis. And at 30 days, there was no significant difference in the mortality. So they concluded that in patients with intermediate risk, pulmonary embolism, thrombolysis can be considered and associated with improved hemodynamic decompensation but there is increased risk of bleeding. There is another meta-analysis of 16 trials with almost the same uh, results. So what is in the guidelines? In the European Society of Cardiology latest version of guidelines, you have to consider rescue thrombolytic therapy in patients with hemodynamic deterioration on anticoagulation treatment, and the level of evidence is quite good. So you admitted a patient who is intermediate, high risk pulmonary embolism to the ICU. And those kinds of patients, guys, should be admitted to the ICU for close monitoring of observation because he might deteriorate very fast in terms of oxygenation, respiratory parameters, or hemodynamics. In spite of therapeutically anticoagulating these patients, he deteriorated more. So you should consider thrombolytic therapy. What if the thrombolytic therapy is contraindicated or the patient has high risk of bleeding? You might consider some alternatives, which are the castor directed therapy. And the castor directed therapy is not only castor directed embolectomy, it is castor directed fragmentation of the thrombus, castor directed thrombolysis, and castor directed embolectomy. And also surgical embolectomy, if you have the facility and expertise to do this alternatives, you might use it, and it has 87% rate of success. So no RCTs to date to support this, and all the data extrapolated from the case, case series and uh, uh, registries. But there is one uh, interesting RCT to date uh, published in the American Heart Association Journal uh, um, regarding uh, the use of Custer-directed uh, thrombolytic therapy, and uh, they use the ultrasound-assisted cardiac catheter-directed thrombolysis for intermediate risk pulmonary embolism. And they, they use the castor for fragmentation, ultrasound fragmentation of the castor in the pulmonary artery, and they left the castor in situ in the pulmonary artery, and they gave the RTBA through the castor directly to the thrombus. And usually in such a scenarios, the doses given is very low dose. It's 10 to 20 milligram only of RTB compared to the 100 milligram of RTB. So the risk of bleeding is very minimal, but it needs again the facility and expertise. And this study it is associated with improvement of the RV function at 24 hours without increasing the risk of bleeding. 
So let's sum up in order not to be confused in the clinical scenario between the different guidelines. If the patient has massive BE, all the guidelines with thrombolysis, with systemic thrombolysis, with almost uh, the same level of evidence. Systemic thrombolysis for all submassive BE, no in all guidelines. Systemic thrombolysis for intermediate high risk pulmonary embolism, yes, 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 but in selected patients. Again, you have to select your patient, the patient who has hemodynamic instability in spite of adequate therapeutic anticoagulation, or if the patient is worsening in terms of hemodynamics or worsening the respiratory insufficiency or severe RV dysfunction, massive or major myocardial necrosis. So you have to consider the reperfusion therapy in such patients, either to thrombolyze him or to use a castor directed therapy instead. Castor directed therapy may be used, yes, especially for such patients who have contraindication to thrombolytic therapy or the patient who has a persistent shock following the thrombolytic therapy that is a failed thrombolytic uh, therapy. You can consider the castor directed therapy. Uh, for the IVC filters, uh, the evidence behind the use of IVC filters is the PREBIC trials, PREBIC 1 and PREBIC uh, 1 follow up at eight years and PREBIC 2 trials. And IVC filters should be considered in a patient with acute pulmonary embolism who has absolute contraindication to anticoagulation, or if your patient has, uh, has recurrent pulmonary embolism in spite of therapeutic levels of anticoagulation, those are the patients to consider IVC filter, but routine use of IVC filter is not recommended. So uh, regarding, regarding COVID-19 uh, related uh, vena thromboembolism and one of the fascinating pathophysiological mechanisms for uh, thromboembolic manifestations in such patients published in one of the studies that you know guys that SARS-CoV-2 targeting the ACE2 uh, uh, receptors and ACE2 receptors is the receptors for angiotensin 2 which later on converted to angiotensin 1-7 which enhances the release of nitric oxide from the vascular endothelium. And nitric oxide is, of course, it's vasodilator and prevents platelet aggregation. So it doesn't work with that. And also angiotensin 2 is vasoconstrictor together with pouring of von Willebrand factor and deficiency of ADAM13. This might be one of the pathophysiology uh, uh, behind uh, the COVID-19 related thromboembolism. Uh, uh, also, uh, in one of the uh, reviews uh, published to date uh, about characteristics of COVID-19 coagulopathy, they found that most of out of hospital sudden death related to thromboembolic events, specifically the pulmonary embolism. And uh, this is the first autopsy series uh, from New Orleans uh, regarding the pulmonary and the cardiac pathology in COVID-19. You can see here the lungs are very congested and, and here uh, the heart, the RV is dilated with flattened symptom. And there is multiple micro thrombi over there in the pulmonary vessels, as you can see this white arrows. Uh, so uh, another study that high risk of thrombosis in patients with uh, severe uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, uh, they found in 150 uh, patients with uh, COVID-19 related ER, this, they found that 64% of them developed the thromboembolic events, specifically double monetary uh, embolism, sorry. That's why the hospitals incorporated in their protocol of management uh, the uh, thromboprophylaxis and some uh, protocols recommended to use the therapeutic anticoagulation. Uh, one from the American uh, eminent hospital is the Mass General Hospital. Uh, they stated that you can consider pulmonary embolism in case of market increase or, or rising of D-dimers from prior levels and acute worsening of oxygenation, hemodynamics, 
uh, which is not consistent with worsening uh, related to COVID-19. So they recommend also to use a bit psych tools if you have uh, uh, a concern in terms of staff exposure or your patient is unstable, unstable to go uh, to the CT uh, and you. Uh, so you can use the Doppler uh, study of the lower limbs to check if there is DVT or not, so you are safe to therapeutically anticoagulate your patient, or to use an echo to see the RV strain, which is uh, uh, unexplained uh, uh, by uh, ERDS. So uh, you might find the thrombus also in the RV or RE. These are the patients you can consider uh, therapeutic anticoagulation. Uh, and one of the interesting protocols also from, from Imperial College for uh, the thromboprophylaxis and uh, therapeutic anticoagulation based on the patient's body weight and D-dimer level. And the D-dimer level uh, ranging from 1,000 to 3,000. So you can consider PD uh, dose of enoxaparin or even therapeutic doses. And uh, this algorithm adopted from the uh, European Society of Cardiology latest guidelines uh, that the patients with acute pulmonary embolism, if you have the suspicion, you should start immediately anticoagulation unless it's contraindicated. So if the patient is hemodynamically unstable with signs of hypoperfusion, this is a high risk patient and you should consider reperfusion therapy and the hemodynamic support. But if the patient is hemodynamically stable, uh, you should do risk stratification based on the pulmonary, simplified pulmonary embolism severity index, and check the, uh, the RV dysfunction by transthoracic echo, or even in the CT, you might find the RV dilatation, which is suggestive of uh, uh, RV uh, pressure or overload. If you neither uh, one of them is positive, so this is a low risk pulmonary embolism, his disposition will be in the floor or the ward. But if the patient has one or two of both plus uh, uh, RV dysfunction and elevated troponin, this is the intermediate high risk pulmonary embolism. And you can see almost he needs also consider admission of this patient to ICU he needs close monitoring and observation for further deterioration, and you can consider rescue reperfusion therapy. Otherwise, he is intermediate low risk pulmonary embolism, and you can consider only therapeutic anticoagulation. So let's take the home message that uh, uh, high level of clinical suspicion is very important as presenting signs and symptoms are variable, and the diagnosis best made by combination of imaging study, clinical probability as well. Prognostic features of, uh, for increased mortality includes PNB, troponin, and uh, RV uh, size and function. And the guidelines recommend thrombolysis for shocked patients. Patients with submissive or intermediate risk pulmonary embolism should be closely monitored further for deterioration and possible reperfusion therapy. You can consider IVC filter in patients with absolute contraindication to anticoagulation. And I cannot finish this lecture without highlighting the BERT, pulmonary embolism response team, because you guys know that there are some situations which are controversial and it is case by case scenario. That's why in the first time in the guidelines, they recommend to set up the pulmonary embolism response team, which is multidisciplinary team that uh, comes out with or comes up with a, a consensus decision regarding the reperfusion therapy, the disposition of the patients, and specifically for the patients with intermediate high risk pulmonary embolism. And thank you. I'm ready to answer any questions. Oh, Dr. Tolo, Prof. Tolo. Oh, good evening. Just uh, mute yourself. Excellent. Okay. Fantastic. So, wow, Dr. Isa, that is absolutely <laughs> outstanding presentation. Thank you. Um, for some of us not working in the intensive care at the moment, I tell you, you have educated us in the very short 45 minutes you have presented. Thank that is you. absolutely outstanding. I say big congratulations to you. Then aside from that, I want to say big congratulations for putting in so much 
effort are world class. Uh, uh, um, number one, they were asking, um, why not use from the Paranox instead of the other agents? And if you're going to be using from the Paranox, what are the advantages over other agents? And one of the yeah. um, attendees asked the question, is there level cementing? Is it available in Egypt? Okay, uh, regarding von der Barinox, it is uh, at the same level of evidence uh, uh, with the low molecular weight heparin. So you can use either low molecular weight heparin or von der Barinox. And the advantage mm. of von der Barinox, it is low risk of head, heparin induced mm. uh, thrombosis. Uh, sure. Levosimdan, I'm not sure. Since a long time I'm not working in Egypt, so I'm not sure it is available in Egypt or not. Okay, thank you for that. Now, the other question. Um, um, I'm sure most of the people that have listened to you, they work in the field of anesthesia. I have a lot of questions, you know, talking about the use of IVC filters. Yeah. Now, one, one person asked a question. Um, can you use IVC filter as a prophylactic measure prior to surgery? For what? Based on the patient, actually. Uh, the recommendation is not to routinely use IVC filter. So mm. IVC filter is recommended for the patients who has pulmonary embolism and therapeutically anticoagulated and there is recurrence of pulmonary embolism or the patient who has contraindication to uh, uh, therapeutic anticoagulation. This is a patient you can consider. Sometimes, and I think Dr. Saad might uh, share us in this answer uh, from his expertise in the, uh, as uh, an anesthesiologist. Uh, but sometimes it is used preoperatively for the patients who has, for example, DVT and is going or high risk for pulmonary embolism and is going to the theater and you cannot therapeutically anticoagulate those patients. So um, Dr. Saad. Certainly, we use them very frequently. If the patient is a high risk for pulmonary embolism, we send them immediately before surgery to the interventional radiology and they insert the IVC uh, filter and they complete the surgery, just to avoid giving them um, anticoagulant uh, prior to the operation yeah. immediately. For, uh, so, for uh, the risk of bleeding, very over okay. risk of bleeding, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Now, another question for you, sir. It says, um, can IVC filter be used prophylactically for patients that have active DV thrombosis? For active DVT thrombosis? Yeah. And he, he is on therapeutic anticoagulation or not? He's not. But they are wondering, can you prophylactically post an IVC filter for somebody no, that is no. suspected? No recommendation <laughs> in this point. No recommendation okay. to the best of my knowledge regarding okay. the use of prophylactic IVC filter for such patients. Beautiful. Now, um, one, one before the last question. Somebody has just asked in the, in the audience, if a patient has pulmonary embolism, what yeah. is the recommended guideline? What medication do you start? Do you start them at the same time on warfarin and airprene? And how long do they stay on the warfarin for? Okay, we have mentioned that uh, during the presentation that if you have a uh, uh, high clinical suspicion that is a patient with intermediate or high risk BE, you should consider uh, therapeutic anticoagulation and it is recommended to use unfractionated heparin based on the local protocol available in your facility, you start unfractionated heparin and you measure BTTQ six hours to the therapeutic target. And uh, also in order to combine the vitamin K antagonist, which is commonly used warfarin, you should reach the target of INR two to three in two consecutive days before discontinuing heparin to continue on the vitamin K antagonist. But nowadays, because of non-inferiority of the Nuax, Rivaroxban, Ibixban, Dabigatran, uh, non-inferior to vitamin K antagonists is recommended to be used instead of this combination 
from uh, the start. I okay. hope I answered this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, um, and finally, somebody just asked that one of their patients has pulmonary embolism and is going for um, a surgery. Do you advise a regional anesthesia or do you advise a general anesthesia for those patients? He has pulmonary embolism. Yes, and the patient is going for his surgery. That if there's an opportunity to perform a regional technique yeah. as opposed to a general uh, anesthesia, which one will you support? I, I believe the decision will depend on what kind of uh, therapy is receiving does the patient uh, uh, on therapeutic anticoagulant uh, or a vitamin K antagonist or uh, NOAX and uh, it needs a multidisciplinary team approach actually between well, the uh, I may take over here if you don't mind uh, basically if the patient has pulmonary embolism he should not go for surgery and uh, if the patient is anticoagulated, if it is emergency, we stratify the risk factors and we advise the patient and advise the surgeon about the high risk bleeding. factor for pulmonary embolism. If the patient is elective, it should his patient should be anticoagulated for at least minimum three to six months uh, on oral anticoagulant or low molecular behavior or whatever protocol by the hematologist and uh, we reassess him again. Uh, okay. I believe elective surgery should not be uh, started before at minimum three to six months. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, I think um, um, Dr. Isa, one more time. Um, thank you so much for this outstanding presentation. Thank you. Dr. Garazi as well. Thank you so much for you know, blowing our minds with your outstanding presentation. Thank and you. finally, I want to thank Dr. Um, Adel Ibrahim, Dr. Sadmadi for this amazing mega course you guys are organizing. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. It is very rich in, and we thank you so much for all the effort you are putting into this. And for all the people listening to us as well, um, we hope to see you again um, very soon um, uh, and very shortly. Very soon, uh, Prof Tolo, and uh, uh, tonight I'm a little bit announcing uh, tomorrow we have another great night, great night tomorrow. We have here now on board Prof Abdrazim Dawlatli, and he's going to give us tomorrow an outstanding um, his experience as a great researcher from Saudi Arabia and the international speaker. He is going to talk to us about uh, your paper in the view of um, editor, reviewer, and reader. Uh, I would like to welcome tomorrow at the same time, eight o'clock in the mega online course, Barof Abdulazim directly, and more than welcome tomorrow, and we can't wait for him. I would like to advise everybody to sign in the Zoom webinar because it will be a great night tomorrow at eight o'clock in the mega online course. Thank you very much for attending tonight. And we are honored tonight as well by our great professor Samir Ansari. And he is attending the whole session and the, raises the two lectures tonight. And I'm so humbled about his attendance tonight. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, tonight, Dr. Sahar Marzouk from the Amiga Online course. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. 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 Thank you.